podcast. Now, now sitting next to Dr. Judith is Miss Judith as well. Welcome to the show. And thank you for having me. And now, of course, we have Barrister Mike Adie. Good morning to you, Barrister. Thank you. Good morning. The pleasure is mine. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us this morning. And we are going to be reviewing some of the emerging issues, including the, um, the um, state of the local government autonomy that has recently been um, issued by the Supreme Court. Now, given the outcome of the Supreme Court's granting local government autonomies, do you consider this to be in the best interest of Nigerians, Barrister? Okay, uh, based on the antecedent and how we have fared so far, we discovered that uh, it is in the best interest of this country. Uh, I see it as one way to cop uh, rural urban drift by citizens of this country. You know, the cosmopolitan cities have become too contested because the local government areas have become more than nothing happening there, no activities there. And the best way, the best interest of this country is to make sure that the third tier of government that is recognized constitutionally is given its autonomy. It's a, a step in the right direction and nobody can question that unless for people who have uh, surreptitious or ulterior motive. Okay, um, Ms. Judith, I'm going to come back to you, but let me stay with Barrister. Um, Barrister, um, different state governors are uh, divergence over the ruling. Why some have expressly stated that the federal government is not um, supreme constitutionally over the state um, government. And others have also um, observed that there is a lacuna between the ruling and the constitution where they have cited the section 162 subsection 6 of the 1999 constitution. And I quote, each state shall maintain a specific account to be called state joint local government account into which shall be paid all the allocations to the local government councils of the state from the federation account and from the government of the states end of quote now um, does this have any implications and how can this so-called lacuna be reconciled you know, this uh, became prominent in uh, 2015 when uh, the state governors decided to have joint account. And uh, if you look at antecedents of local government areas after 2015, you discover that uh, local government areas have become more than nothing happening there. And uh, the activities of the local government areas have been completely shattered by state governors. This is what plays out. And that is why state governors are interested in who becomes the local government chairman. In most cases, you discover that. Um, Let's speak of the fact that we don't allow that uh, provision was spawned into the constitution because to me it was a pay in cool, it was pay ignorance. It's not something that's supposed to be because it goes foul to the tenets and principles of this government. And as a developing nation, I don't think that we should allow the government to have so much power, especially considering the fact that local government areas are recognized in the constitution. Yes, that is uh, has been infused into the constitution. But when you look at the activities of governors, you discover that most of these allocations meant for local government areas have been hijacked by state governors. They decide whatever happens, and in most cases, you go to local government areas and discover that they've been taken over, taken over by weeks. Nothing is happening there because everybody's looking at the state capital the same amount they can get from the governor. And the governor, knowing this, with this understanding, makes sure that people who are appointed to local government areas are people that will be some sort of been answerable to them, you know, subservient to them. And that is why they have absolute control over local government areas. And you discover that criminality has increased over time because youths who come from these local government areas have become idle. They have nothing to do, they have to survive. You see how we are increasing every day. So many criminality and so many vices increasing because of this hijack of the local government area, the third tier government, which ought to be autonomous by the local by the state governors. And let me come to Miss Judith Bagidi. As a part of those who ensure that there is accountability in governance under Action Aid Nigeria, it has been about following the money in those times. And now one thing that the local government, the third tier of government has complained about is being stifled from increased FAC allocations. Now through your work and observations, would you say this is indeed a fact and with the hope that this judgment can upturn the situation? Um, well, one of the things I would say is that um, for the three um, federal government, let's look at it from the three federal governments. They all have their an allocation to them. 
um, from the federal, from that's from the revenue itself, the Nigerian revenue itself. From the federal level, you have about over 50 percent, and then you have for the states about 26 percent, and then the local government 20 percent. Now, um, if everyone is actually working with what's assigned to them, I see that um, there will be change actually down to the local government because the local government from time has been it has been there. It's been um, right from when it was they were called the district officers, even to 1976, where um, the local government administration started. Now, will there be challenges? There definitely will be challenges. Um, but that is where why you have while we have been fighting for the cause um, for local government autonomy, we've been looking at also ensuring that the local government system is also built in terms of their own capacity. Um, um, when everybody's people are pe everybody have different perspectives to these things. Some people um, are happy about the fact that it's going to happen. Some people are thinking that it's going to be a problem. But let's. I feel we should try them out first, and then um, definitely where it is needed, capacity is sent in to be built. Um, for this um, local government um, officials, um, it's actually going to be a very very good system because it brings the the, um, the the government back to the grassroots. It makes the people at the grassroots, everyone, have a feel of the government, and then you get to realize that um, there's a bit of um, reduction in power um, in some certain tier of government if the people actually have access to the government know what they are doing correctly if you look at the election um, you'll see that there's a dwindling rate of um, of out uh, participants from the presidential down to the local government because people do not even understand why the local government is there but once the, once this once this autonomy is there people will begin to understand why the local government is there people would come out people will be interested in the government in the system and also people would um, this is also a room for us to have a uh, means of accountability like you have mentioned where we have people um hold their government accountable and from the grassroots level down to the federal level so if we know how to do it at the grassroots level trust me we would know how to do it at the state level we would also know how to hold the government accountable at the federal level itself now we look at the situation and i like the fact that you highlighted the roles of elections now we're told that 13 states are in a rush to conduct local government polls who would have talked before now now the challenge here is with the conduct of the elections now there are debates on should it be invested on INEC at the federal level or should the states uh, independent electoral commissions be the ones to conduct the election do you think this would in any way affect the voter appetite like you said in terms of the confidence in the conduct of the elections um so i think the reason why people are worried about um the sec um that's the state's um, um, independent electoral um, commission itself it's because of um they are being um, governed by the state government and there is the fear that um, you will be loyal to whoever who is um, whoever who pays the pipe or you will be loyal, loyal to that person but like I mentioned earlier there is room for change luckily we have the constitution being amended um, we don't really need to dismantle we, we might need to maybe change the people there but we don't really need to to, to, to cut out that structure totally and um, we could actually change the people in there and also ensure that in the constitution they understand that um, they are working for the people and not for the state government itself now barrister this is where you come in conversations around amending an already amended constitution or scrapping it and having an entirely new constitution that captures we the people of nigeria now in line with this call for local government autonomy we still have some sections of the constitution making for provisions of joint accounts how do we engage the national assembly in forging a new constitution that local governments have full fiscal and financial autonomy okay i want to start by the establishment of the uh, of uh, you know prior to this time the government at the federal level understood the difficulties, the challenges of making sure that uh, these local government areas become autonomous, and that is why NFIU was established. And the current objective of setting the NFIU was to make sure that uh, no state governor had access to local government funds. And at, the, at that level, uh, the, uh, the federal government was mandated to only send uh, allocation to states that have conducted local government areas and had local government chairmen to sign the allocation. But I don't know how the governors went about it and it was hijacked at some point. 
But looking at it holistically, you discover that uh, uh, the governors are equally smart. They do their best possible because they equally understand the fact that uh, should this be, they may not have enough resources to play around with. Uh, I want to equally go back to the aspect of uh, INEC being given the mandate to, to conduct local government uh, elections. And let me tell you, the state governors, being as smart as they are, would make sure that whoever is appointed at the state level to superintend over local government uh, elections must be subservient mm -hmm. to the governors. And in doing so, you need room for reading, manipulation of the election process to make sure that whoever is appointed by the governor of that state emerges at the end of the day. So if the constitution is amended, this is to embolden in the local government area. That's the target. Because whatever has been doing right now should be reduced into writing and make sure that that section which gives uh, the governors the mandate to establish joint account the their puppets, I call them puppets because they are stages as well. Stages and all that. Because they are responsible for their agents. You know, they always sign this allocation and hand over everything to the governors. And the governors will in turn give them peanuts, some in some cases ten million, five million to run their affairs. Not necessarily to run their affairs of the local government area. As compensation for being subservient to the governor. You give me a small allocation to make sure you run your immediate family, not necessarily to run the top tier of government. So if that section is amended, it should be in a plus for this country because whatever we're doing, let's understand the fact that we are an emerging democracy. In most cases, we test run some of these things to see how well it will go down. In, in our, if you look at our, our antecedents, you discover that most of the things that have happened in that time, especially as it concerns the local government areas, have not been successful, they have not been beneficial to the people in the rural areas. Some of these things should be amended. And to give effect to these amendments or to these uh, agitations, it should be reduced in the writing by way of uh, amending the constitution. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Barista. You know, over time, people have assumed that nothing goes on in the local government. And just like you rightly observed, when you get some local government, um, it's full of weeds and grasses. You begin to ask yourself, is this part of the government? And as a matter of fact, the local government is actually supposed to be the most functional um, level of the government because they are closest to the people. To now, regardless of the ruling of um, Supreme Court granting local government um, autonomy, we cannot deny the fact that the governors still have some level of control, control that's right. over the local government. Concerns have been raised on um, sharing allocation of personal frameworks, conduct of free and fair and credible elections, and some quarters have even gone ahead to um, state that there is need for the anti-graft agencies to be cascaded down to the local government. Now, what are your thoughts on all of this and how? Best, do you think this could be decentralized to make it work to make the local government chairman truly have that autonomy? Because I have witnessed a situation where the chairman, before he takes any decision, he has to go ask the governor. I don't want to mention the state. So, how can this thing really work to make sure they have the needed? 100% autonomy needed to run the affairs of the local government, which directly impacts the grassroots. Who need this? Well, the process of uh, the local government area, the process of uh, giving actual autonomy, practical, seeable, feeling, touchable autonomy to local government areas has just started. That's just the beginning. Thank God to, you know, uh, for the decision taken by the Supreme Court, you know, granting autonomy to local government in the country and that would follow up with amending the constitution you know by the two term majority votes of members of the national assembly a joint session of ask you know containing the constitution well uh, you know we are humans and uh, by virtue of uh, antecedents and past or whatever we put into play uh, would definitely reflect in our lives and our existence and whatever we do today do not forget the fact that there's a future you know to be reckoned with you know, whatever you do to do that is contrary to the principles and dictates you've adopted over time would definitely catch up with you in the near future. But coming back to how to make sure that some of these funds are properly utilized without undue influence by the governors. Mm, we already have an anti graft agency. It's been difficult, you know, to make sure that they are accountable to the people because they are cut off. They are not there, they're not doing what they're supposed to do. The same governors have taken over everything. And if you look at what 
is uh, playing out now. There's so much concentration of power at both the federal and state levels because the local government areas are more and more important. People don't see anything happening there. In most local government areas, you see that even coppers, senior defense officials have taken over the place. There is no proper administration going on in the local government area. And that is why there's so much attention at the state level. And you see that most cosmopolitan cities are congested because of the fact that these local government areas have been cut off. The anti health agency has a lot to do. We're humans, we're Nigerians, so we know in most cases we try to be you know, smart and do certain things. But if the local government leaders are conscious of the fact that they are being washed by the anti graft agency, the people who use these funds or who authorize the use of these funds, like the NFIU, make sure that the money gets to the local government, they will be monitored, their activities will be monitored. You see activities, you know, I've tried to look at uh, the second schedule or schedule of the constitution that spelled out the activities or the responsibilities of the top tier of government in the local government area. And I discovered that based on what in practical terms, you know, some of those things have been cut off. The constitution at that level has become the mere uh, love notes and not uh, effective at that level. Now, to carry more of our viewing audience along, the conversation is usually from a more informed and educated angle, talking about the constitution. Often at times, we relegate the office of the citizens. Uh, we have the privilege of also having your colleague Adesua, who is the coordinator of the Clean Justice Initiative in our studio. Uh, and it's premised on the angle of citizen led engagements to ensure accountability. Is there any of such uh, cautious efforts on the part of Action to engage the citizens more in this discussion on local government autonomy? Um, yes, we are actually working towards um, not just building the capacity of um, the local government um, officials themselves, but also letting the people understand um, their rights. Um, when they understand their rights and also understand the role of the local government, um, like I mentioned earlier, it helps accountability. Now, the community themselves will become um, like community watchdogs that are working towards um, looking at the local government and seeing that you're doing this, you're not doing this. Um, you are giving these resources, we are monitoring what you're doing and we're seeing what you're doing because they're actually closer to the people, so people have access to them. The people at the grassroots would know um, when, if there is transparency, would know when there's an allocation for social rules mm -hmm. and then the people can voice out by themselves. You know, th there's this thing when you understand rights and when you understand responsibilities you know people begin to voice out formerly we were not like this in nigeria people hardly voice out but currently we have people voicing out because they are understanding their rights and um, like you mentioned the clip justice project where we are going around um we've gone around different states educating people about their rights we've been able to even bring down um the electoral act in a in an easy to read format it, like for each section has a one page so people even understand what's there it is now when you have that understanding that you will be able to to be a watchdog you will be able to be a monitoring tool yourself you will be able to call out the local government that hey this is what you're supposed to do and you are not doing this currently this is our right this is from our tax this is what we pay for you need to do it for us they have access to this um to, to the local government so it's easy for them to actually monitor at that stage yeah um miss chivet i'm um, talking about um the autonomy vis-a-vis -vis and the clamor for minimum wage mm. now um the question that keeps um ringing into the ear of everyone is how do you think the local government will be able to measure up with the 250,000 naira that the level is clamoring for as the minimum wage, given this new autonomy? Does it mean that local government allocation would also be increased, or? So when um, when there is a minimum wage, there is a minimum wage, both at um, the civil service, even to the private and. Um, everywhere it cuts across everywhere and um, the good thing about the autonomy is now that um there are different implications to this local government autonomy i've been able to um try to look at it from the legal perspective um there's also the concern of the governance issue and then there's also the development implications of it now this question falls under the development implication of it it simply means that with these resources at hand um, the local government also have the right to ensure that they have increased revenue. Do you know that um, I was reading um, a paper yesterday, I think it was the cable, and they mentioned something about if you look at the resources that the local government gets from 
um, the emirat the, the market women association you realize that they would be able to outturn the state and even do do more things much more than the state government will be able to do because the resources at hand aside from the allocation at the 20 percent allo allocated to them they would also have different other resources if well used and turned over rightly you would see that they will be able to meet up to that and even outshine the state gov gov um, government themselves well, Vice, I don't know if you have any thoughts to add, and I want you to look at it from the angle of a lot of restructuring that will take place beyond FAC allocations. There's also the question of security votes, which the governors largely enjoy as it were. Now, if the local governments are to gain autonomy, it would need, mean that they would also need their own security votes. And who are you to deprive them? They are the ones we devil more with insurgency, banditry, issues of insecurity and family clashes. How do we begin to prepare the minds of our uh, good sub regionals, the governors, to allow for this autonomy to be seen to be working. Because they have also talked about the case of not being able to separate the baby from the mother, making reference to the caretaker chairman, soon to be duly elected chairman, we hope, to be one of the babies and the governors, the mother. Okay, I want to look at that in a very practical way. Maybe look at uh, the autonomy granted the states. It does not uh, prevent the federal government from having overriding influence over the state. And the same thing goes down to local government areas. The fact that uh, the local government areas are autonomous does not mean that uh, the state governments will still not have you know, an overriding influence. But when it has to do with revenue, 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 uh, it's an exclusive, it should be seen to be an exclusive uh, reserve of the local government areas. I think, like uh, Dr. Judy just said, the local government areas have all the avenues where they can generate funds you know, through taxation, uh, looking inward to see how they can. Uh, the minimum that was is that is an exclusive reserve of the federal so government areas. So let's look at the three lists, major lists that the grant uh, responsibilities to the top tier of government: the exclusive list, the concurrent list, and the residual list. When you look at the things that have been spelled out in the residual list, since we're talking about local government areas, you discover that these are things that can easily be handled by local government areas without necessarily having to rely on the local and the state governors for funds or funding. Now, local government areas should be self-made. The economic, because I looked at this second schedule of the 1999 like constitution, and I discovered that the economic base of local government areas should be generated by the local government chairman and not necessarily the uh, state governors. But because the state governors have enjoyed this process of revenue generation that ordinarily would have been going to the state, uh, to go to the local government area, it became at some point very difficult for the sustainability of, sustainability of uh, the local government areas. If the state will uh, probably reduce some of those responsibilities, some of the, th the checks on local government areas, especially the economic or financial uh, checks on the local government areas to make the to grant uh, the local government uh, uh, chairman the responsibility of making in order to generate funds that will enable them on the local government areas without unnecessary interference by the uh, state governors. So that's why I look at it. Okay, um, well, um, there is no doubt that a lot of emotions and sentiments um, have continued to trail um, the local government um, autonomy. And um, just like uh, Bito rightly said, that uh, this is akin to a child being forcefully taken away you know, from the mother. Of course, there will be sentiment. But um, we strongly, um, well, Nigerians strongly believe that this is the in, in the interest of the Nigerian. And of course, let's see how much this will lead to um, rural development and reduce um, urban rural migrations and to some extent even see how it can curb um, insecurity in the country. But away from this issue, let's quickly look at other emerging issues in the nations that um, talks about the 2024 supplementary budget where the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, has requested that an additional 6.2 trillion naira be injected into the budget. Ms. Judith, what is your take on this? <laughs> um, I would say um, for initially the, 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 the 2024 budget was 27.5 um, trillion naira and um, with the projected revenue at 
points, um, I think several trillion or so. Um, I think I'll come from the first point of before you project your revenue, you should look at what happened the previous year in 2023. What was our revenue in 2023? It was 5 trillion naira. So if we had 5 trillion naira from 2023, um, how would you now project 18 trillion? Although there have been conversations around the exchange gains as a result of um, the doubling, um, so if as at 2023 it was at 400 naira, um, right now being at 800 naira, at most worst case scenario that would lead you to 12, um, sorry 10 trillion naira. If you want to outstretch it to um, to to 12 trillion naira, which um, might not be feasible, you would realize that um, this request actually is going to put has a lot of implication looking at it from the economic implication looking at it from the physical implication it's there's going to be a lot of implication to it um now there's um the the, the memo says um i think it has it, it talks about 3.2 going to um capital mm -hmm. or recurrent recurrent yes and and three, three, three trillion to um capital capital, capital, project. capital project itself and um how would that money be gotten if last year our revenue was at five trillion, how would that money be gotten? Um, what are the implications of this? Is that it simply means that um, we are going to have more debt. Um, we have an issue already with the um, foreign debt that we currently have, foreign domestic. All of them, we have a whole lot, a whole lot of debt already. So how will that extra six point two trillion be serviced? It means we are going to go into more debt, mm -hmm. and if we are going into more debt, um, what is the implication of that as well? We are also going to look at it from the angle of the inflation. Our inflation is really high. Now, putting six point two trillion into the economy again means that there will be more ex. ex, ex Excess money again at hand, which would also lead to another increase in our in the inflation rate. And there was also the angle of the memo that talked about the um, the the foreign the, the the tax the the tax on the um, on the foreign exchange of the bank. Now, at the end of the day, you realize that the the banks are going to push the burden to the consumer. And if they push the burden to the consumer, what what does that mean? We would have um, exchange rate instability. Now. We already have a huge exchange rate instability. The Naira has been wiggling. And now you're pushing more things that is going to bring more hardship on the people. It's going to bring um, an increased inflation. And it's going to bring um, exchange rate instability. So these are some aspects of it that um, I feel it's going to cause. It means we're going to go into more debt. means that there will be inflation, higher rates of inflation and also exchange rate instability correctly in the country. Now, Barrister, Ms. Judith has done a very beautiful job of creating a background and walking us through the 27.5 trillion naira budget in the need for the supplementary budget as written to the Senate by President Bola Metinibu. Now, the concerns are what our projections were hinged on. Now, we're told to expect an improved oil output of 1.8 million barrels per day. We're also told that uh, the mining sector, which you talked about, has revealed gold bars and presented them to the President, meaning that Nigeria should have some security in gold reserves. Now, despite these projections, we're still largely relying on borrowing. And Marco Baesian has also asked the federal government to review its borrowing plans to sustain this budget. Uh, what are your thoughts in this regard? Well, I, I want to deviate slightly from what uh, Dr. Judy's position is. Uh, most times, uh, some countries survive by borrowing. But what matters most to us as a people should be this uh, pro the projections or this uh, borrowing. What are you borrowing this money for? Are you borrowing this money because you want to establish industries? Are you borrowing this money because you want to have so much in your recurrent expenditure? Are you borrowing this money because you're, you're projecting a better future for Nigeria? Are you borrowing this money because you have revenue, uh, an increase in revenue? That will determine what will happen at the end of the day. If we borrow this money because we want to go into more meaningful ventures that will bring more revenue to this country, I think it's a step in the right direction. For Mr. President to have undertaken that step, I think he knows the shoes of this country, so he knows where and how it is biting. He will not just borrow money because he wants the country to sink. He's probably borrowing money because he wants to put this money into more meaningful ventures that Nigerians will be happy at the end of the day. Investors will be established, uh, our refineries will work. You know, when we on the refinery is working, I, I see Miss <laughs> Judith raising her hand at me. Hello, <laughs> on the refinery is working, you can see she's already. No, already I'm, giving, I'm, I'm just giving a hypo, uh, hypothetical analysis. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying the money will be or is intended to revamp the refinery because 
at some point in time we've heard so much about the refineries i'm giving a general analysis i'm not aware of the purpose for which the, the president is asking for uh, an increase in the budget. budget it depends and what matters most to me as a person as a lawyer is what does he intend to inject this money is it in more meaningful ventures or economic ventures that will change our rules or change the economic base of this country or the status of this country as it is right now that will determine what will happen at the end of the day well, let me hear how right. just so I, think, I think i think um, my question will now be um from the ones we have borrowed before mm -hmm. what was it used for you know um there's the issue of trust currently it is um from the um the the, the workings we have seen before that people are having a problem with new policies and new injections and new borings and all from we have about i think about one and twelve trillion currently that mm -hmm. what has it been used for has it been invested wisely most times you see that at the end of the day corruption takes a huge place out of it maybe it goes into infrastructure um sorry into building um of a build a cap, um, infrastructure and then that is the easiest way to actually and make money because if you come if we come here today and you ask what is the cost what did we put in what did the how many cement bags of cement entered into dbn building we will not be able to say because um everybody will come with different quotes and all so what the previous money that has been borrowed what has it done before we now go into borrowing more it is when we have seen the workings of the previous ones that have been borrowed then we can now say okay it makes sense to actually borrow more but if we don't have um concrete evidence of improvement in the economy on what these monies have been borrowed before so why do we keep going back to to borrow you know um when the previous <laughs> same guests was in the studio with us um this same issue was raised mm -hmm. and um it was highlighted that a lot of nigerians feel that this is going to be business as usual you know mm -hmm. whereby they award some contracts on this capital intensive project and it gets abandoned mm -hmm. there are so many federal roads today that are in great um, state of disrepair leading to so many loss of life and um properties but regardless of all of these things um since the federal government has said that this is meant for um, um development especially the capital intensive and not necessarily consumption it still brings us to this issue of this same minimum wage now uh, we all know that a lot of funds we are recovered stolen funds and all of that barista why do you think the nigerian should go above when they say that even up until today they're still talking about their bachelor's loot now why do we want to go into the what happens to all those funds that have been recovered? recovered where are they what are they being used for well, one thing is uh, the government to tell you what they want to tell you or government officials to tell you what they want to tell you to promote uh, its uh, activities or to create a positive light in your minds. But we have over time, they have had governments that have been very insensitive to the plight of Nigerians. The essence of every government, especially as has to do with third world countries, is to be uh, what we call a uh, political palace, propagandist machinery of government. The government will not tell you what it's feeling. They will tell you what you want to hear. I and mean, because we are most times sentimental in our approach to analyzing or judging every government, you know, we are carried by whatever we are meant to know and not necessarily what the truth is. Well, we are born in the past, irrespective of what these monies have been put into. Uh, that does not mean that uh, if we had made mistakes in the past, and we shouldn't uh, take, take uh, further steps to see how those mistakes can be corrected. Uh, I don't think there is any meaningful uh, government especially as it is right now uh, when you look at the uh, mr president right now he's uh, someone who is uh, an economist uh, I, I would want to be uh, to say ill about the previous government uh, the previous government acted woefully and that is why nigerians lost confidence or uh, based on the known credibility or credible level of the previous government uh, we have given up on this country some persons have given up on this country but with the policies of this new government and even though the intention is to borrow and continue to borrow and there are some day and some time some of these persons will be now, now as we look to wrap up we have a little less than five minutes to do so okay. it's from the approach of a needs assessment kudos to the current administration it has outlined an eight-point agenda which is based on the welfare of Nigerians. 
We've seen the Lagos Calabar Coastal Highway project come up as one of the projects that is looking to be completed despite the humongous funds needed. But the challenges Nigerians are seeing at this point we need to be carried along. Can we see the need assessments for those in the local governments, state levels, and federal governments? Are we sure that some of the priority projects are in line with what Nigerians want? Economists are also asking can we see a medium, short term framework in terms of the policy direction affecting key areas of the economies? In the next two or three minutes, let's get your thoughts individually as we wrap up. Okay, um, I think there's actually a need for um, project prioritization itself. Um, and not and also when we're prioritizing projects we should prioritize it based on the people themselves there's uh, news of um, the, the, the decision makers trying to build a hospital um, a special hospital for for themselves if the hospitals the health sector is working why do we need to build a new one especially for some set of people it simply means that there is a priority issue there. While we are prioritizing, we should remember that we should prioritize alongside with the needs of the people. How do we actually help the people? That is why we elected them there. And that is why they should also do things to, to the benefit of the people, to the average Nigerians themselves. Why are you building a new hospital um, for, 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 for some certain class of people, which is automatically bringing inequality already? And while we cannot also prioritize um, minimum wage, we cannot prioritize the health of people. People are dying because of um, because of ill state of the, 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 the health system currently, and also the education system. There's a whole lot of things we need to prioritize. I feel that there's the need for that needs assessment, but it should be people-centered because you could do a need assessment and it is not people-centered, it is politically centered. So we need to focus on the people. Let's get your thoughts on no, that. No, 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 Nigeria, there's more Nigeria than the Nigerians. You know, and the constitution talks about the fact that no Nigerian should be discriminated upon based on the circumstances of his or her birth. Nigeria is for all of us in respect of our current positions. Whatever position you occupy now is a passing moment. This government should look at the people and not the system itself. Everybody is important as far well as Nigeria is concerned because the days of reckoning are near and let them wait until it snowballs into crisis in this country before we understand the fact that the people are yearning for actual and true leadership in this country. Well, um, thank you so much for joining us this morning on these insightful conversations. And to you, our listeners, of course, we keep saying here that the conversa conversation um, continues because the Nigerian project is an ongoing project. And as individuals, remember you have responsibility. There is need for you to hold your leaders accountable on all of those things. So thank you so much for joining us this morning. Over to you, Bito. Well, indeed, much like Dr. Judith said, the Office of the Citizen is a very pivotal one. We must say thank you once again to the Governance Manager from Action Aid Nigeria, Ms. Judith Bagidi, and also to Barrister Mike Adinye, my very good friend and legal luminary, for sharing his thoughts on the, comp on the show this morning. Be reminded that you can re-watch this episode on our YouTube channel and endeavor to follow us on our on online platforms at 